everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for the uh, Big Data, Big Help, or Big Pain online workshop. Uh, we appreciate you guys taking time out uh, of your busy days today, uh, busy schedule, and I uh, hope you'll enjoy our presentation. Uh, we'll be getting started uh, very shortly. Just uh, give uh, everyone a couple more minutes to to log in and, and join us for today, but uh, we'll get started here in a, in a few minutes. Thank you. Hi, if you've reached uh, the web conference for Big Data, uh, Big Help, or Big Pain, you're in the right place. We're going to go ahead and get started here, I think, in a few minutes. So hang tight, and uh, we'll be going here in just a second. Yep. Uh, before we get started, everyone, I'd like to go through some uh, housekeeping. Um, during the workshop, everybody will be placed on mute, uh, but we encourage you to submit all your questions. Uh, there's a questions and answer dialog box um, that you can submit your questions, uh, and we'll answer those at the conclusion of the, uh, of the uh, presentation. Uh, following the workshop, um, the slides and video recording will be available to you. Uh, we guys will send you an email um, uh, getting you the links uh, to both of those items. And again, uh, we thank you uh, for joining us. Um, welcome to today's Big Data, Big Help, or Big Pain uh, workshop. Um, I2 Total Cost Management enables organizations to see projects before they begin, understand projects and execution without being there, and reuse past project information to build better projects to predict the future. The secret to I2's success is leveraging a single platform that enables total integration across the project lifecycle from budget, estimate, design, progress, field progress, accounting ERP, and forecasting. Uh, we are thrilled today to have industry expert Ron Babich presenting today's workshop. A leader in cost management, Ron Babich, RIB, North American CEO, has increased value, profits, and repeatable processes with successful technology organizations like Hard Dollar, Telesoft, and Sage's Sales Logic over the last 20 years. Additionally, his expertise has been requested at industry conferences like SME, ITFMA, and the CPM conference. Ron's cost management passion was ignited at the beginning of his career as a CPA and youngest controller for Western Savings in GE Leasing for Construction. With that, I present Ron Babich, CEO, RIB. Hey, thank you. Thanks a lot, Michael. What a nice introduction. Way too generous, but thanks very much. Very, very nice. Hey, thanks, everybody, for uh, attending today. Um, I, I'm pretty excited about this um, webinar because I think we can learn a lot about um, things that we should measure, things that we shouldn't measure, um, who cares about certain big data things and what we should care about, what we shouldn't care about, and kind of compare notes on um, best practices. I These are some of my uh, favorite times of the month when we happen to have these workshops and we we've been changing the the, the volume a few times we've gone from scheduling um, to uh, specifically progress measurement uh, to our uh, specifically 5d BIM and this session is really all around uh, big data elements 
uh, what's important, what's not important, who cares, why should you not care, uh, and kind of focus on the things that are, are um, being used today by some of the industry leaders, and then what are the things we shouldn't be really focused on. That's just a big cliche, and of those things that we probably want to ignore more than pay attention to. But thanks for taking a few minutes today. Um, we are recording this session, so at the end of it, if you want to use the slides or, or part of the session or there's some statistics, because I think there's some really great statistics in here too, not to brag, but there's some pretty awesome stats in here. Uh, you could use those for uh, some future project stuff if you're interested as well. Again, thanks for taking some time with us today, and we'll go ahead and get started because we're uh, just past the top of the hour. So for some reason, you know, there's a, and this is a great example that I kind of like to bring up, there's a, there's a big disconnect between consumer products out there and what we find available to us in the construction market from a big uh, project perspective. You know, I very much know when my balance, and hopefully <laughs> hopefully this isn't a regular issue for me, that my balance is below $35, you know, uh, in my account. If it isn't, I've got some probably pretty big problems. But that's an easy thing, and it's a, it's a thing that happens for all of us that's available to us all the time now. A couple of weeks ago, and I just brought up this example that, you know, I was bidding on some um, star Stormtrooper characters for my kids, and I got notified like four times that I was outbid instantaneously, almost annoying how many times I was notified about that. Um, also, networking notification, and I don't, I don't care, I've never played the game, you know, um, but my mom plays it and, and some other people play it, and I get these, these stupid Candy Crush notifications all the time, and other uh, kind of Facebook notifications. However, then... If, we, if those things are so not meaningless, but if they're just so trivial and they're so available in the consumer market, then why are we still living in the Stone Age in the construction side? And then why is it from the perspective that we have that the um, we are losing uh, information at a $1.3 billion project where we should have some of that information on uh, to, to take place? So we've got things that are uh, over on CPI and that we're running behind schedule on and that we have this in massive project without any notification on progress and productivity. And the reason, obviously, is because, uh, which gets a little bit complicated, we'll talk about some of the little bits and the big data parts of that today, is there's so many disparate uh, elements within those projects that we get things that are not talking to each other, that are not working. And we can get bank notifications and Facebook notifications because, yeah, it's all on one platform and things are pretty seamless and it's pretty simple, yet we're getting these notifications over um, on the consumer side, but we don't get any kind of notification or knowledge on the enterprise side where we're at. So here's a, here's a, here's a quick quiz which is really interesting, and this is all about kind of leaders and laggards. When we talk about leaders, if you think about leading companies today, they were just as dominant 25 years ago. And honestly, think about it for just two seconds. Just try to name one of those companies. I, I guarantee you the landscape has changed uh, drastically uh, when I kind of, we kind of look at this next slide. So I put this together uh, to kind of show an example of that. You know, we think, yeah, we're killing it in construction. You don't, you, we don't need to do anything different because we're the dominant leader. Well, you know, guess what? Blockbuster was the dominant leader in distribution uh, just 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And now Netflix owns that market because of mail, the Internet, and that technology. Dell was a leader as well. Dell was that leader, and then they, they lost sight of the importance of the tablet, the Asian PC manufacturers, and then end-to-end -end service. Again, a technology-driven kind of um, miss misplace on their part. Microsoft, not to say they're not a leader anymore because they certainly are, but they missed the boat on having the foresight to understand that new technology that give the ability for web TV, smartphones, and the tablet PC slipped away. Motorola, another great example of a leader in the market on cell phones, dominant, dominant, dominant player in the cell phone market, lost because of smartphones, email, and then the data focus from other manufacturers. Uh, everybody knows Sears, Sears major leader, and then became uh, kind of a technology leader, if you will, in their own right, just based on the catalog, um, uh, the availability that they had when they first came out, and then lost insight on insurance, financial services, and then a, a total mishap on web strategy. Once again, all, all on the right-hand side falling around technology mishaps. On the left-hand side for Sony, Walkman devices, again, we're thinking about device brains versus circuitry, which was another... Um, kind of big tail over some microsystems, another dominant enterprises, but less costly servos, servers, and then and then Oracle coming along to to, uh, to take over, of course. Toys R Us, another one. Online stores beat them out, and then better service. And then Yahoo uh, missed the boat on free services, which didn't have the foresight on the free services side where, where Google did originally. 
And all of these guys were dominant players 25 years ago, 15, 25 years ago. And the same equation happens for us in construction, where we are, or we may be, a dominant player in construction, but we have to be cognizant of the not only the tools, but the infrastructure that's around us to leverage that information. So um, we're fighting the status quo on this, and why should we put the effort into us at all? Because we do want to increase our profitability as organizations. We want to drive our project delivery time. We're trying to create distinctive competency against other uh, project companies that are in the same space as us, and then we're trying to establish long-term collaboration standards. I mean, these are those internal mantras that should be part of every organization. But much like biologically, you know, fight, flight, or freeze, organizations do the same thing. So the reaction to surrounding technology from an advancement perspective is typically we have two ways to go here. One is, yeah, we're going to go ahead and fight, and we're going to go ahead and enhance our technology. We're going to embrace things that are, that are new that make sense to us. However, unfortunately, those things do have a high stress. They're much harder. It takes a very focused effort. And the, the results, though, however, are awesome because it increases our, our exponentially our ability to have great results. On the flip side of it, though, it's much easier to sustain the current behaviors, to maintain status quo, just like that long list of co uh, companies we just looked at that were powerhouses 25 years ago that lost and missed those opportunities. Why? Because it's a lot easier, it's low stress, we don't have to work at it, and it's maintained. What we're about to talk about, some of the data structures we're going to look at, yeah, it's, it's work to do it. it it's, it's not easy just to sit back and um, uh, let those things go. But the effort that we put into it will have the, the long-term results. So what's created the opportunity? And let's, let's just talk about reality and not uh, philosophy for a second. So what's created the opportunity? Four things have. Number one, the size of retainable data storage is now available to us where it's affordable. Yeah, has storage been around? Yeah, it's been around for uh, a million years, but the price of storage has now come down to where it's so low, and I'll show you what that looks like in here in a second, that it's make, it makes it to make sense where we'd start doing things today that we couldn't even do two years ago. Bandwidth is on the same side. Between the last two and five years, I'll show you kind of a quick graph on that, where now we have the ability to leverage those things, also leverage mobile data accessibility with, with smartphones and the smartphone plans where they're not as costly like they were, again, even three years ago. And then application collaboration, the API warehouse that wasn't even available with things like Primavera where we couldn't really use the APIs the way that we wanted to with SAP, with, with, uh, with, with uh, Primavera, as well as uh, Oracle and, and others. So let's talk about that for, real quick for first, and which is pretty interesting. So the incredible cost of, of hard drive storage from 1980 to the present, how much it's, it's uh, declined from that cost of storage to make it affordable to us to put this data somewhere once we decide what we're going to use. The second part of it is bandwidth. So as our, our uh, growth has happened in terms of bandwidth usage, that decline of cost has continued to decline exponentially, allowing this to be so much more affordable than it ever has been before on the bandwidth side. And then you look at mobility and just pick out mobility. The number of smartphone users in the U.S. from 2010 to 2017, which has not been that long a period of time, has increased exponentially as well. And you can see we're going to grow even more. And we're already using our smartphones, and I'll talk about that in just a second, just that flip that we made this year, which is, which is, uh, which is a monumental uh, flip in itself. But that's happening in 2013 and what we're projecting to see in future years. This is what I wanted to share with you. One of the most interesting things that's happened this year in the U.S. is that the usage and the way that we look at data that we're all accustomed to, going back to my Bank of America example and the eBay example, is rather than looking at information on, online, sitting in front of our computers like we are right now, we made the move this year from two minutes and 19 seconds to online viewing to two minutes and 20 seconds, two, two minutes and 21 seconds on mobility. Why, who cares, what does that matter? It's a change in behavior. It means that, you know, as users, as, as young people, as uh, people of all ages, we've now made that adoption from how we used to look at data to how we're very used to looking at it. So when I talked about how difficult it is, we're, if we make the right kind of information available, in the right format. Um, our users are already used to use it, viewing data that way. And, and in 2013, that was kind of a big flip for us in the US. Also, US monthly time spent on, on internet sectors, we're also very used to, and this is, can't be to anybody's surprise, but we're also very used to being social in the way that we're doing our data now, too. So 
it's not like you go, well, if I send that over, you know, if, if, if I do this in the wrong way um, or the right way, it won't be interpreted correctly. Today, you know, and the, and the numbers back it up 100%. Yeah, we're very much a social network block society. We're very much used to using computers to get, do our, use our information and share that information. Um, age impact, though, average age of a civil engineer in the United States is 59 years old. Is that an old age? Absolutely not. But the challenge is to adopt processes and technology and sometimes learn new things for a lot of new people it, it has an impact to that. That participation for further education on engineering, construction, and manufacturing is driving a need to centralize that process where less resources are available and more centralization is needed. So what's the, what's the issue then? So we, we're, we're saying, look, as a society, we're getting used to it. The, from a cost, it's available to us. There's no excuses anymore, data-wise, bandwidth-wise, device-wise. What's the problem? Well, on an average project, and this is an average project on the enterprise level, two-year project average 23,000 activities or more. Uh, a lot of you have much less, a lot of you have a lot more. But average, if you think about it just for this example, 23,000 activities for a two-year project uh, average, average size. Uh, and now we take those activities and they've got to be in four different places. They've got to be in a schedule, or some of them do. Some of them are going to roll up, or all of them are going to run up to uh, cost codes and account codes and financial actuals. Then we have the estimate, and then we have to show them to some degree in controls, execution, and progress that these things become part of all of those. And that's where things really become difficult, because it's one thing to say, great, we've got a mechanism now to deliver it, but now I've got all this stuff in disparate information places, locations, so how do I fix that? Well, the average project size, not to uh, uh, add on more doom and gloom, but the average project data scope, schedule, and cost size in terms of data is 50 gig. So when we think about the complexity of a, that's without a 3D model. So when we think about a complexity of a 3D model, that's another 300 gig. And so the good news, bad news is we can do this stuff now because we have the mechanisms that are much lower cost to track and size it. We still have disparate information we have to deal with, but the cost of storing, the cost of sending, the cost of viewing, it's much less now and it is now achievable, where we really didn't have the ability to do that even a few years ago. What's the average organization? 50 times by 2020 in structural leads and building, uh, uh, structural leads the, the, the cost here in buildings and bridges. So the organization from a data growth perspective will grow on the average by 50 times by 2020, which means that all the data that we just talked about a second ago with models and non-model related things will grow by that, by that rate. Um, so data rate almost two times each year. If you look at all global data across the board in, in Zetabytes, and I just have a reference here for Catherine Zeta-Jones, which has nothing to do with the Zetabytes, but also it starts with the same name, um, is, is expected to grow twice as much each year. So if you take your average data storage each year and double that each year upon year upon year. That's what we're really looking at all the way across the board for project and then non-project related companies. However, so if you, if you think about that for a second and you go, okay, if projects are that complex and then things are that desperate or disparate, I should say, um, and the volume is, is that high, then where do we stand from a construction perspective in our investment back into IT? And you look at it's from top down. You go revenue of $250 million, 1.6% of those of us in construction are spending 1.6% in IT. Those are the smaller guys. If you're $10 billion or higher, 1.1% of revenue spent in IT. And if you look at that and you compare that to all the other industries out there, and this goes kind of back to the Stone Ages and that last place award that I have over on the right-hand side. We are dead last when it comes to technology. You know, banking is extreme higher. Education, so even software, of course. Healthware, um, media, uh, retail and wholesale is right down there almost at the bottom as well. Telecom. But really, construction of materials is really dead last in, in terms of how we look at um, technology. So in a way, and I think it's positive, it's kind of the last frontier of, hey, we can make this better now that we can make it better because we have the outlets to do it if we know what to focus on. If it's true, and it is, that 70% of the U.S. productivity 
originates from the information that we have in front of us and getting the information faster. And that front end planning makes a huge difference when you look at the numbers on the highest ROI of what's actually making an impact for best, uh, best processes when it comes to improvement. And the numbers stand behind it every single time, both historically in both manufacturing and construction. When we do our front end planning and our income stands behind it as well. 30% of it net income affected from the economics of scale from actually being efficient and understanding where, where our uh, productivity is coming from. Common faulty logic, um, you know, we'll give you a couple examples. So we talked about some of the positives, but some of the, some of the negatives. Estimating a turnaround, this is a real project um, uh, I pulled, an estimated turnaround time, three hours, actual historic turnaround time, you know, three weeks on this particular project. Uh, another one of a thousand reasons I have here, delivery of steel to the site over complex schedules. So sometimes making the schedule too complex instead of making it simplistic that these logic ties don't work. So faucets on the 23rd floor in this particular project, and again this is a real life project, faucets on the 23rd floor because of this complex schedule delay concrete, and this sounds ridiculous but it's a true story, delay concrete on the fifth floor. How in the world do faucets have anything to do with concrete? And, and nobody's having the insight to be able to see that and, and delay that because of the, the ties and dependencies that happen on the schedule. Another one, and this is a common one for all of us, which is just the omission of historic benchmarks and history, and which leads us to missing scope items that are identified way too late in the project that have a huge project impact on what we're doing. Another one, use of five data. Uh, to on uh, a single project. So we have 80% reduction in time, 98% reduction in number of field travel days, and less field rework for craft. And this is a, a real project example where the use of 5D data we used in a positive way to reduce the design time, to reduce the field travel days, and then to uh, uh, lessen the uh, rework work for the craft. Um, a couple of uh, barriers to overcome here. Code variations, so uh, unfortunately, unless we have consistency throughout the process, the, the jelly bean example that I used kind of in the, in the beginning, um, where we're notifying people of certain things that are happening, if all our jelly beans aren't the same color and we're not notifying everybody at the same uh, nomenclature that they're used to seeing, then we're going to have problems with that because we won't be able to get our notifications all on the same page. The lack of infrastructure, the, the jigs and the templates, another big uh, problem for us as well too, where we don't have... Uh, standard templates that are set up so that we, we have an infrastructure that's there in place that everybody can use regardless of, of where they're at in the food chain. And on the leader side, that it's repeatable and that it's scalable, um, which is another two big problems that we need to overcome. However, w when we look at shipbuilding in particular, and I, and I really like to kind of kind of uh, focus on the shipbuilding because it's a great example of, of what's done right in construction where we can reuse things, where we can pull from a product database and look at products, reusable production, reusable reconfigurable items on every project, that we're standardizing modules, that we're using sub-assemblies, that we're grouped by families. It, it's so well organized and so well structured that we have to get to the, a very, very kind of similar point in a, a similar process uh, within our own realm. Um, Here's an example that I, I just kind of used here. We, our plant zones for mechanical systems or public zones for lobbies, built-in manufacturing type of facility to be shipped to the job site for installation. Um, if I drive, dive into the schedule, a WBS, and associate those costs, the size of that data uh, can be um, out of control when I look at one WBS item if I don't have that same kind of consistency like we do in the manufacturing for shipbuilding. I may have one WBS item, but it's three days to schedule the crane, it's five days to schedule the crew, I've got seven days to schedule the materials, all around the same WBS item. So it's not just one item we're looking at, it's what are the consequences of my one activity against my crews, my labor, my resources that are around that crew, and how can I manage it? I think the only way for us to really get there is by tying these things together. We, we, we must, we must, we must tie scope, schedule, and cost together in a way that makes it simple not too complex so we can actually do it, but makes it simple enough for us to connect the dots. And then the, the bonus of all of it is if we can add the visual aspect on top of it so we can actually see it and then get the alerts that we need to do that, then it's a home run for, for everybody. So eight steps to get there, um, and, and a lot of these are really on the estimating side. Number one, we've got to clearly identify what we're doing on the WBS side from a task perspective. We really, gotta, we really have to have a mechanism that gives us broad participation in the preparation of 
the cost model and the estimate side and progress so that we, we get everybody involved in that, uh, in that process. The availability of that historic data and that benchmarking data is a big deal so that we don't make mistakes we made in the past and that we have reference points that we can use for the future. Standardizing the structure for the estimate is a big, big deal as well too, much like the shipbuilding example I used, so that we can actually use the same kind of standard structure each time we do specific types of work. That we provision a program for uncertainties, and you say, well, how in the world am I going to do that if it's uncertain? I, I, I can't provision for it. But that's, that's part of it. If we, if we have some solid benchmarking and some solid averaging, at least we can do is uh, predict some things for and accommodate things for escalation for weather, escalation for labor shortages, escalation for other things, and historically look back and see what we've done. But again, it's making the data available. Recognition of inflation is usually, uh, usually it's, a, it's a missed item oftentimes as well too uh, on one of those uh, escalation processes. And then also recognition of excluded cost so that we have things built in that are overhead and other items that are built in for supervisory costs and other excluded costs that are just missed. And then last but not least, and some of the leading companies out there follow this uh, to the T, is the independent review of estimates. That over here in this silo, you know, we're going to do the estimate and build it out, and then over here in this other silo, we're going to also look at that cost model. And if we don't come within a certain degree of percentage together, then we're going to take another look at this thing together. But um, these things, I think, are critical uh, for that collaboration to take place and that review. So we'll, when we get to that point where we've got it all wrapped up, now we're going to make sure that the cost element out of that estimate is valid, that the labor includes the time phase breakdown, that the calculation on each element is correct, and that the program is accurate total of all the sub-elements, and then we apply the escalation. I mean, those really are, the, are those five things that we're going to do once we get our, um, our, our model put together. So our keys to success, and I'll show you a couple of examples here that we're, we're going to focus on, um, is the initiate the estimate at the estimate level for calculation of production. Start it right at the estimate level, not to be an estimate zealot, but I think the estimate's one of the most powerful things and the most important things out of the whole process, that we absolutely must time phase our costs, because if we don't, we can't do any of this stuff that we're about to talk to on the collaboration side. We, we can't get accurate cash flows. We're not going to be able to do cost to complete. We've got to time phase our cost and make it simple. And it doesn't mean we're tracking everything. It just means we're tracking our high risk things. And that we're also cost phasing our scheduling activities. So when we're building out our schedule on the right hand side and we're building out that schedule part of it, that we're adding those costs and resources where it's appropriate. No, we're not going to resource and cost load every item in the, in the planet. We need, to, we need again, to, to cost and resource load those things that are appropriate. Um, cautious burden in the field, leverage existing process so that we're use, using the information that we've had in the past and that we extend our collaboration that we don't use now that we have, once again, the mechanisms like our smartphones and the web, and I'll show you a couple examples of this where we should focus, that we extend that collaboration to the owner, to, to the EPCM, to the, to the contractors, so there's a happy medium between all of us here working together and leverage the existing technology. Again, in the last two years, huge advancements with most of the manufacturers out there uh, for APIs as well as the um, size of the data that we can actually deal with and then the cost of bandwidth uh, dropping down to what it has. Um, core process, it's got to be a top-down strategy. It means that we, we have to get um, uh, executive and managerial approval to really make sure this has happened because not everybody's happy with changing some of these processes and it's the fight or flight thing we talked about earlier um, about uh, being easier being hard but the results are undisputable cost estimate to measure the original plan strong leadership uh, demands the EVM the stakeholders have to make it clear on accountability EVM at the program level EVM at plan detail using cost performance integrating the schedule and then visual planning execution they absolutely guarantee guarantee our 15% to 30% cost reduction in the cost that not only comes to manage that project, but also in some of those missed items, which can be anywhere from a 1% to a 30% or even a break the bank uh, project item, which if, if all of you on the line have had, a, I know, a similar experience, um, all it takes is, is one big item uh, to, to hose up the whole project. So we're going to kind of focus here in a second and what are the things we should really look at and what's realistic versus um, uh, just hypothetical. So uh, real change, moving mountains versus leveraging technology and, uh, and touch points. What are those touch points that we should look at? Um, today we're going to look at 
focus on the platform that deals with connecting the estimate to the model, to the progress, integrating it as a schedule, doing the forecasting into accounting, and then benchmarking history. So we're going to start with kind of the, the key basic things here. The 3D model, the 2B model, the historic database, the Excel spreadsheet, the third-party data, all of which now are integratable. I, I hope, uh, and, I, and I got my fingers crossed, that you know most uh, most of you either are already using the uh, MC Squared tool or the I2 uh, platform. And it, but if you don't, um, and you're, you're using something else or you want to use something else, the same principles still apply. Our ability now, there's no excuses now to bring the 3D model, the 2D model, the historic database, all into one place where we can have a standardized WBS, standardized the quantities, standardize the resources, and then model the information out and cost load the schedule without a lot of headache because of the integrations that are available now. Again, within the last two years, huge progress in the APIs that there's, there's kind of a no excuse now to cost and resource load that schedule if, if our lives are in sync. And the same applies really to the 5D model because once now that we've got access and the API with the 3D model, and again, the advancements that have been made in the last couple of years, there's no reason now for us not to cost and resource load the 5D model. Integration on the scheduling side, um, massive, massive uh, expansion on, on Microsoft Project over the last several years with the Microsoft Project Server, as well as uh, Oracle Primavera, of course. The important things here are start and finish dates, the resources, the roles, and the custom fields. Same thing here. Now we want to time phase our cost, time phase things that are in the model, and again, there really is no excuse why we can't do that. One, one might say, you're thinking, well, what if I don't get the model? Uh, or what if I don't have a model, or I never get a model, or I get a model late? That's okay. This is this is um, this is if we've got one. It doesn't make it mandatory, but it adds that extra bonus of icing on the cake if we've got it to add the visual. And then obviously, in, in most cases, you know, I, I think IPD the statistic is less than two percent of projects, two to three percent of projects, are done with um you know with IPD. And from a model perspective, it's it's even when you do get them, it's it's twenty percent have a comprehensive model. So once again, it's it's not that we have to have this, but visually it's, it's great if we do, and now we can finally use it with the APIs that are in place. The other part of this is progress collection. So now we've got data integrations that are coming in from everywhere. Once again, I, I hope you use our, one of our products, but they're just, they are now available in um, Oracle. There's SA, SAP, uh, uh, About Time, the uh, Microsoft Project Integration, all around three key points, quantities, percent complete, and then notes and conditions of the uh, work activity that's been done on site. Once again, those quantities then drive that percent complete, which then drives uh, cost to complete and revolves around the schedule, drives the percent complete, compares it back to the original estimate, as well as loads it into the model. Um, it, it really is at this time that we're in right now where it's never happened before where we can tie all of these things together like we can today. Um, and let's just talk about SAP for a second, but really the same applies for Oracle Financials. I've dumbed this down to make it kind of simple, but um, over the left-hand side, we have actual costs that are coming back from SAP, a vendor master that's coming back from SAP, material pricing masters, and then, again, hours and quantities. So when we look at do we need to integrate everything, nope. But the important things for us to get to where we need to get to tie them together are actual cost, our labor, our quantities, our percent complete, our vendor master, and then driving that earned value from the original estimate to the 5D model. On the forecasting side, there's three critical things here. One is comparison to the original estimate, or original budget, comparison to the current budget with approved committals and changes, and then lastly, compare it to the current estimate with unapproved changes. But again, the key thing here is approved changes, commitments, and progress, being able to compare and benchmark against uh, really the three main versions of that original model, if you will. There's, you know, six other variations here, but these are the, for simplification uh, purposes, those are the kind of the three major ones. And then throw that uh, forecasted earned value against the estimate back into the ERP system and compare it to the model. It's, again, once, uh, once these APIs are available to us, which they are now, uh, we can integrate those things together. So simplifying the attack, taking P6, taking ERP, and how do we do this without overcomplicating this? Because this sounds really great. I uh, hope it sounds really great, but if, uh, how does this integration stuff work? How can I really simplify it? Well, to be honest, just just to start out, from a start and finish date perspective and the percent complete um, dynamic direction into P6 and back into our um, activity level estimate here is all we need. 
if we can just get our start and finish dates and our percent completes to and from P6, we're in really, really, really good shape here. On the ERP side, there's only really four things that we need to be solid in simplifying this attack. Number one is, yes, we're going to push a budget over the ERP system. Um, yes, we want to have actual costs when we can get them from the ERP system so we can play our budget to actual so we can do our cost comparison. Um, it's very easy to roll up and to, and to drive and have a common cost code and account code between the ERP system and the project system on the right. And then last but not least is the WBS, standardizing the WBS so that when we roll up the cost and account codes that are next to the WBS item, they're transparent and they're, they're equal to on both sides of the fence. Just this alone, just simplifying that attack and then either bringing the data in from the field that contains some or all of this information or bringing it directly from ERP gets us there to some quick productivity views that are part of that process. Let me let me ask uh, let me let me open it up for questions because we're almost at the um, we're almost at the uh, forty almost forty minute mark. Um, I was going to uh, was going to sh show some screenshots today and kind of get into some of the details, but I, instead let me let me open it up and ask if there's any questions on any of the integration points or any of the uh, uh, data that we covered. Michael, do you do you have any questions? Here's one. Um, are are you limited uh, by uh, the amount of data you can bring into into this platform? Is there any limit to anything? No. So that's uh, that's a great question. So I I, uh, I would say two again a couple of years ago um, size limitations might, on a project might be you know fifty thousand to one hundred thousand items. Today um, there are customers like on the I two platform that have up to. 100, 150,000 items. There's, a, there's a, one client that we have has 200,000 plus items, uh, activities. I'm um, not sure how many resources are behind it, but I know there's 200,000 activities in on the uh, WBS level. So um, you're only limited now by the, the size of the hardware that you get because we're, we're taking advantage of the full 64-bit platform and the, and, the, and the cloud environment that it sits on. That's a good question, though. Any other any other um, questions about the platform or or any integration or or some of the simple touch points that we should focus on? I, I think I think you can. Um, there, there's no other questions, Ron. Okay. All right. Well, I, I appreciate you you joining us today. I think what I'll do is. Um, We'll make the slides available with some of the statistics, and what I'll also do is I'll include some screenshots of what some of those data points actually look like in the presentation so you can download those and see, hey, how does P6 actually integrate into this type of platform with SAP? Um, how does the progress get collected from the field uh, into, that, uh, into that process as well, too, so you can kind of eyeball those and stare at those, uh, those screenshots. Uh, I've put together uh, three different areas for those, one on schedule, one on ERP, and then one on progress, uh, all against the kind of original estimates. So you can kind of see that. Um, and uh, we could have a whole other session just kind of dedicated to just, uh, just the touch points themselves. But I think the point of today was to talk about what are the simple ones we can do? How can we do this without getting too complicated? How can we reuse the information we already have? In many cases, uh, and in most cases, we're not asking um, to, to do extra work out in the field or extra work, you know, in the back office. We're saying, look, use the systems that are existing today to leverage that data. Let's leverage the existing APIs that are out there today, and then let's let's connect our dots simply, not in a complicated fashion, and have some big results and show visibility that we've just never had before. And, and, and that's where the real results are coming in, and that's where the leverage can be without adding a bunch of uh, complexity to the process. Ron, we have a question. Um, for the larger international organizations, can you process the data from multiple locations at the same time and keep a full revision history? 
Yeah, so there's two parts two parts of that question. So uh, can you do it at the same time? Can you, can you process a lot of data at the same time or from multiple locations at the same time? And then you, can you look at a log history? So in, in our platform, there's, I'll, I'll kind of go backwards with the, with, the, with the questions. In our platform, there's a, a history file that logs every entry that comes into I2 so that for, for every update, for every change, there's, there's a uh, history log that you can look at. Who made it? When they made it? What did it affect? Was it from the schedule? Was it from ERP? What was the source of the change? And what was the value amount that affected that project change? It'll, it'll show you that as well, too. Um, as far as multiple, sort, multiple um, uh, uh, imports at the same time or multiple API integration at the same time, it runs on a service. So uh, there's two ways we're bringing data into the system, the very sophisticated way that I'm talking about, and then the kind of Neanderthal but still cool way of doing it, but I'll talk about the sophisticated way. On the sophisticated way, it runs as a service. It's an XML service that listens for updated information out there. So if I sent 16 different locations in at the exact same time, the port is only going to um, uh, receive uh, – the port is only going to process one of those locations at a time, but the speed in which we're doing it is is um, is uh, is um, at light speed. So if we had 60 different locations all sending XML at the same time, the XML um, would be received um, in in a linear fashion through one port, um, but one one batch right after the next. So, uh, for example, so we, we have clients today that are in Australia, that are in China, that are in um, New Zealand and, and the UK, who all send into a, a, a global headquarters, which it happens to be in Australia, on a nightly basis. Um, in their case, they do it within a two-hour period, but some of those, a couple of those locations are within the same hour. So the, the way that the technology is, and this is an automated technology, the, the kind of the cool way I'm talking about, which is the, through the XML service, all of that information gets processed uh, at the same time by the service listening and waiting to, to hear the next XML library that gets sent down to them. Uh, so yes, it's a long way of saying, yeah, you, you, you can absolutely send uh, a lot of information at, at the same time from different locations and it won't, it won't step on each other. Any more questions? Awesome. Well, thanks for joining today. I, I will make sure that we, we, we send you some uh, a link that's got some real-life examples so you can see those touch points and kind of uh, think for yourself. I would highly recommend, if you're even slightly curious about this, to uh, reach out. I, my contact information will be available after the uh, uh, presentation as well. Uh, please reach out to me uh, or anybody on our team, and they'll be glad to kind of walk you through a kind of a quick 10-minute, hey, here's how we connect the dots. Here's how we set up those controlling structures. Uh, in the system, which are neat and flexible for SAP and for Oracle, so you can uh, make those uh, connect the dot processes pretty simple. Just reach out to us. We're happy to give you like a 10 or 15 minute overview or however long it takes to show you how that works in, in your world so it, it connects in real life. Um, but I, uh, I, I appreciate the attendance today. Thanks very much for attending. And uh, as always, uh, we'll, we'll keep it simple and keep trying to reduce uh, cost and increase our productivity. Thanks for attending today, and uh, have, a, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks a lot, everyone.